Today, let us break a common misconception. Can electricity really flow through air? We've always learned that air is a poor conductor of electricity. But is that the full truth? Take a copper wire and form a simple coil. This coil has two terminals which we connect to a multimeter. Now place this setup close to a high voltage transmission line. It's important, do not climb the tower, simply stand on the ground. The line should be at least 220 kilovolts or 440 kilovolts. You will notice that the multimeter begins to show a voltage. This indicates that electrical energy is traveling through the air and reaching the earth, essentially a form of wireless electricity transmission. This voltage appears mainly because of electromagnetic induction, not because the air itself is conducting like a wire. However, if the electric field becomes strong enough to ionize the air, a breakdown occurs. During breakdown, the air turns into a conductive medium and can form a dangerous arc. If a person comes into its path or provides a return path to the ground, a severe electric shock can occur. Now because of this risk, ultra-high voltage transmission lines keep their phase conductors placed far apart. The large distance ensures that the air between them continues to act as insulation under normal conditions. But as we just learned, air can allow electricity to pass when it becomes ionized. This means air is not a perfect insulator, especially when we deal with higher ultra-high voltages. That is why substations are built over large areas. We must maintain enough distance between phases so that air behaves like an insulator, not a conductor. Because of this spacing requirement, switchyards spread over wide land areas. Such arrangements are known as air insulated switchyards or AIS. Now imagine the same 400 kV switchyard being built inside a small building. The only difference is, instead of using air as insulation, we use gas insulation. This type of switchyard is much safer and requires far less space, so it can even be installed on the ground floor of a building. Here, a 400 kV transmission line is arriving and is terminated on a gentry tower. The first device connected here is a lightning arrester. It provides a low resistant path for lightning strikes and over voltage surges on the line, so the excess energy is safely diverted to Earth. Next comes the CVT the capacitive voltage transformer which measures high voltage. Apart from power transmission, the transmission line can also carry communication signals from one substation to another. The CVT injects these high frequency signals into the line and later collects them as well. But we only need 50 Hz power frequency in the line. So a wave track blocks the high frequency communication signals and allows only the 50 Hz power to pass ahead. Up to this point, all components were air insulated. From here, the line enters a gas-insulated bushing. Below these bushings are large cylindrical pipes, which are hollow from the inside. Inside these pipes run a solid conductor, commonly called the bus conductor. To keep this conductor properly supported and prevented from touching the outer metallic casing, insulating supports are placed at intervals. These are known as epoxy resin spacers. Epoxy resin is mixed with silica or aluminum filler to increase its strength. This provides mechanical support and ensures that the conductor does not make contact with the outer hollow pipe, which is usually made of aluminum or copper. At the end of each pipe, a special type of insulator called a barrier spacer is installed. These are conical in shape, and their unique function is to completely seal off one chamber from the next. So at these points, barrier spacers create a closed block inside the pipe. This block is then filled with SF6 gas, typically up to 6 bar pressure. Inside the sealed section, SF6 functions as the primary insulating medium. Now think about this. In a high voltage AC line, the supply constantly alternates. This creates a time varying electric field. Such a field can energize air particles and travel outward, possibly reaching the outer metallic enclosure. We saw this earlier with the multimeter example. The changing field from the transmission line charged the air and induced voltage at ground level. But here the SF6 gas filled inside has a dielectric strength almost three times higher than that of air. Let us simplify this. Air has a dielectric strength of about 30 kV per centimeter. So if we apply around 50 kV per centimeter, air starts behaving like a conductor. In comparison, SF6 gas has a dielectric strength of about 89 kV per centimeter, nearly three times higher. As a result, its particles become less ionized, reducing the chances of breakdown. However, SF6 reduces ionization, but does not fully block electric or magnetic fields. Some field still reaches the outer metallic enclosure, which means high voltage can be induced there as well. 
But once these fields strike the enclosure surface, they terminate, because the system follows the Faraday cage principle. When a metallic closed surface is installed and properly earthed, no electric field can be produced inside it. Without an internal electric field, no voltage can form. This is why the pipes and GS substations are repeatedly provided with strong earthing connections. One important point. In high voltage systems, each of the three phases has its own separate mechanism, but all of them operate in the same way. However, in 66 kV or smaller substations, separate pipes are usually not provided for each phase. All phases are carried together in a single enclosure. When the incoming line reaches this point, the first block is the line earthing section. Even after an ultra-high voltage line is switched off, a small amount of current may still remain, due to the electric field we discussed earlier. This makes maintenance unsafe, so the line conductor is earthed, which allows any residual current to safely discharge into the earth. Next comes the isolator block. An isolator functions like a normal switch. Its mechanism can be operated manually by rotating the moving contact to isolate the line. In GIS switchyards, isolators are typically motor-operated. Once the line is disconnected, the moving contact is connected to earth again for safety. If any minor current remains, it flows directly to earth. One important point, an isolator is an offload switch, which means it cannot interrupt current in a live line. It can only be operated when the line is already de-energized. You'll understand the reason for this shortly. Each block is sealed on both sides by barrier spacers. So, if SF6 gas leaks from any one block, you don't need to fill the entire system. Only that specific block is serviced and repaired. In 66 kV or 132 kV GIS switchyards, a lightning arrestor is often installed in parallel with the isolator, but since this is a high-voltage line, the arrestor has already been installed outside. After the isolator comes the CT block, the current transformer, which is used to measure current. In a CT, the main conductor itself acts as the primary winding, and around it, a toroidal secondary winding is placed, containing a very large number of turns. Because of this high turns ratio, the output is reduced to about 5 amperes, which can then be measured safely with standard meters. The current transformer also measures fault current. When a fault occurs, the current rises sharply. The CT detects this rise and sends a signal to the circuit breaker, which is positioned immediately after the CT. A circuit breaker has two contacts, one fixed contact and one moving contact. The fixed contact remains stationary, while the moving contact is operated mechanically to open or close the circuit. Whenever a fault signal arrives from the CT, the breaker's operating mechanism activates, separating the moving contact from the fixed contact. When the circuit breaker opens, an arc is formed between the contacts. This arc is absorbed and extinguished by the SF6 gas. However, because the gap between the contacts is still quite small, the small amount of current may continue to flow even after disconnection. Therefore, for complete safety, after the circuit breaker opens, the isolator is also opened. This ensures the line is fully disconnected. From here, the circuit breaker supplies power to main bus 1 and main bus 2. Why two buses are used will be explained shortly. Each bus has its own isolator, which is earth when not in use. For now, let's assume the main bus 1 is in operation. From the bus, multiple feeders are taken out. Each feeder has the following sequence per phase. Isolator, to current transformer, to circuit breaker, to isolator. From here, the feeder reaches the power transformer, which steps the voltage down from 440 kV to the required 220 kV or 120 kV. Similarly, multiple transformers can be connected to multiple feeders from the bus, allowing power to be transmitted to different regions. So far, we have only looked at the basic layout of a GIS substation. In reality, multiple feeders supply power to it. For example, incoming line A may come from a generating station in one state, while incoming line B may come from a generating station in another state. Both lines contain similar equipment, and can energize main bus 1 and main bus 2. Now observe carefully. Suppose a fault occurs on incoming line A. In that case, the circuit breaker of incoming line B is closed, which energizes the main bus. This allows supply to continue to the outgoing feeders, without interruption. If power demand increases, both incoming line A and incoming line B may need to operate together. 
In this situation, both lines feed main bus 1 and main bus 2 simultaneously. For example, incoming line A may energize main bus 1, while the isolator of main bus 2 is kept open. This means that main bus 2 has no electrical connection with incoming line A, so all feeders connected to main bus 1 are now supplied by incoming line A. Now let us talk about incoming line B. This line is supplying main bus 2. As noted earlier, its isolator toward main bus 2 is kept open, which means there is no electrical connection between the two buses. Therefore, every outgoing feeder connected to main bus 2 is powered by incoming line B. One important point, we saw that after the lightning arrestor, a CVT is used to measure voltage. But suppose there is not enough space to install a CVT outside? In that case, a CVT can be installed at the far end of main bus 1 or main bus 2. Inside the GIS to measure bus voltage. For systems of 132 kV or below, a voltage transformer is used instead. Both CVT and VT are connected in parallel with the line. Sometimes, both buses need to be connected together to share or balance the load. For this purpose, a bus coupler is used. The bus coupler also contains a circuit breaker, CT, and isolators in its arrangement. This is how a switching substation manages load. In fact, GIS technology allows the entire high-voltage network to be built on a compact floor inside a building. Because SF6 gas provides strong insulation and enhances safety, these systems operate reliably even at extremely high voltages. Thanks for watching.